happy to come and speak today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our observing program at uh, the RIM 3.5 meter telescope. You'll see on the left here an old friend of mine, maybe it's a friend of yours, Burnham 151. It's a ver very well studied system and I'll show you what it's done over the last uh, 10 years or so. Just that, just that. <laughs> but uh, if we wait a little bit more, and I think the orbit period is about 26 years, Bill can correct me if I'm wrong, then uh, you know, we'll get, it'll get a little bit more interesting as we go along. But uh, a little bit later in the talk, I'll, sh I'll talk about Burnham 151 a little bit more. <coughs> so uh, at the Wind Telescope with the speckle camera that we have, there are basically three observational programs. I'll describe each one briefly. Uh, the first one is one that we've been working on for quite some time. It's kind of amazing to think of it. It's 15 years now, which if you'd told me in 1997 I'd be going out to win for 15 years, <laughs> that would be uh, quite surprising to me. But uh, one of the reasons we've been able to achieve that longevity is because uh, my main collaborator there is Bill Van Altena, who's one of the faculty at Yale. Actually, he's emeritus now. And so we can use the Yale allocation of time to uh, get time each semester. Um, actually, another collaborator I need to mention in this project is actually Rush, Rush Janay. He uh, uh, spent a couple nights with me, as he told you in his talk yesterday, uh, late last year. So uh, I'll also tell you about work we're doing uh, for Kepler follow-up. And the main collaborators there are Steve Howell, Mark Everett, and David Ciardi. And then there's a third project I'll mention a little bit about, which is cluster binaries. We're looking at two clusters, M35 and M67, and we're looking at the binary populations. and trinary populations of those clusters. So first let me mention the instrument that we're using. It's actually uh, an instrument that I myself built at uh, Southern Connecticut State University. Uh, it's a dual channel speckle imaging system, which means that we have two electron multiplying CCD cameras that both receive light from the target simultaneously. We have a dichroic, uh, in, which is sort of the heart of the instrument, and after that dichroic, uh, through the transmissive channel of the dichroic, we can put a red filter. Through the reflective one, we can put a green filter, for example. There are various combinations we can use, but that's the way it looks in this figure. And so, and then we have these two uh, Ixon uh, EMCCD cameras made by Andor. So those are quite nice uh, instruments. And I've always been confused about the pronunciation of that. I kind of prefer Icon, but then the uh, salespeople at, at uh, Andor call it an Ixon. So I think that's a, I don't know. But I also say latex, so you know, <laughs> that kind of shows you. Uh, here's a picture of the instrument mounted at the Naismith port at Wynn in the left-hand side of this uh, view graph. And you might ask, well, why two channels? And so there are essentially three reasons for that. There are some, you know, the, the first two are kind of obvious. Uh, if you get light in two channels, then you're getting more photons. And so that's, that's nice because you have uh, more photons to work with. You can, also, you can also make a color measurement in a single uh, data file, basically, uh, because you have that information sitting right there. But the most important reason, the, the, the really the main reason you want to do this is because in the end it's going to give you a uh, higher resolution. It will make your camera uh, a higher resolution system. And the way that works is as follows. Uh, you guys all probably know that uh, when you look at stars through the atmosphere, the atmosphere acts like a big prism, and so it disperses the light a little bit. And that's a problem for high-resolution imaging. And so, but if you have, uh, then, and there are ways to compensate for that, uh, uh, as we know. But, uh, but basically, uh, if you take col uh, color information, if you get information in two channels simultaneously, you get a lot of leverage on residual atmospheric dispersion. And uh, that can help you to make measurements where you dip below the diffraction limit. So one of the things that we really push hard on with this system is to be able to do that. So it, on the right-hand side of this view graph, you can see examples of, let's say, speckles from a binary system where the separation gets smaller as you go from top down to bottom here. Okay? So this is a well-resolved system, right? These would be, let's say, perfect double speckles uh, for a resolved system then this would be what we would call classically at the diffraction limit where the, the two airy disks tend to blend together a little bit. And then if you go below the diffraction limit, then essentially what you get is just one elongated uh, pattern. Now, if you didn't have the color information, you might say to yourself, that could either be residual dispersion in my camera or 
uh, maybe, the, maybe that's a binary that you're not quite resolving. So by getting the color information, we can actually make that determination because uh, if it is dispersion, then that's a color-dependent effect. And if you resolve it, if you analyze it, rather, as if it were a binary star, then what's going to happen is your separation will come out as different in the two channels. Yes? And so, uh, so we can sort of make that determination. So the, the bottom line is that the two channels, the main result is that it allows us to go below the diffraction limit. So let me show you a few results. This is a, you know, uh, sort of your run-of-the-mill um, relatively bright binary star. I think this one is sort of fifth, fifth or sixth, something like that. And so um, basically out the other end of the camera system when you do all the analysis, what you get is two diffraction-limited images. And so these are nicely, this is a really nicely resolved pair uh, at win in both of these particular wavelengths. Okay, so um, here's a nice result on a much fainter system. These are surface plots, but it's sort of the same idea. The left one is uh, a bluer filter, and the right one is a redder filter. And so uh, this is a system that's about 14th magnitude. And uh, so you can sort of get a gauge from the noise grass that you see around those two peaks, uh, the quality of the images that we get for a fainter star. The other thing you can see is that uh, the secondary peak is a lot taller in the blue uh, image, right? And so uh, this is one illustration of the fact that the camera does give you some color information. This secondary uh, was known from spectroscopic means to be a uh, white dwarf. So it's bluer than its primary. Okay, so the main science that we want to do uh, with the first project that I mentioned in the beginning with Bill Van Alten at Yale is basic astrophysics. Um, so stellar masses, um, we have a, a good chance with this instrument to resolve a lot of spectroscopic binaries and get individual masses that way. That's obviously for uh, giving information to get better, more precise information with the mass luminosity relation. But as many of you may know, Bill Van Altena is a, an astrometrist He's sort of a classical astrometrist, so one of his interests is uh, the galaxy, the motions of stars in the galaxy. So we thought that this would be a nice project to work together where we could maybe use binaries as a clue to both star formation and galactic evolution. So basically what Bill has done, and collaborators who've worked with him at Yale, is for, he's developed this list for me of thick disk binaries versus thin disk binaries, right? So at Yale they have all this astrometric information, and they can tell us from things like the space velocity, metallicity, and so on, they can tell us probable thick disk members versus thin disk members, and then we can study those and see whether the binary characteristics are different, whether you, know, you have different range of separations, eccentricities, and so on. In this bottom plot, this is one that came from the proposal, the NSF uh, proposal that re resulted in the grant that we now work off of. Uh, so it's a little bit old, it's a little bit out of date, so Bill, please forgive me. But, but anyway, on the left-hand panel, this is the HR diagram of systems that at that time had a 1% or better uh, estimate in the semi-major axis according to the sixth orbit catalog. So it really was not that many systems. And then we proposed a sample that was mainly drawn from Hipparchos and that we could divide up into this thin disk and thick disk, uh, these, these subsamples. And then if you plot the HR diagram of all those stars, it looks like they're right. So the, the idea of the proposal was to go from this in terms of our knowledge of semi-major axes to looking at this population and working on that. Okay, so here's a specific example. Uh, this is a system that we ourselves discovered in 99 at Wynn. It's a pretty small separation system. You can see the uh, separation is sort of a tenth of an arc second or semi-major axis is somewhere around a tenth of an arc second. Um, and these are the measurements that we got over the years. Uh, point where the camera that I've really an operation, so I can now update this picture to this. This is what we get with new points from the, uh, the dual channel instrument. And you'll notice if I put on the locus of diffraction limited points around the primary location here, that would be here. So uh, the, the, the four points that we've gotten since 2010, thanks, are um, below the diffraction limit, okay? and and. We feel that these are pretty robust measures. 
we've written a paper that sort of describes when you can dip below the diffraction limit and when you can't. Uh, you can't do it for every source. You can't do it on a 14th magnitude source. But on something as bright as this, if your signal to noise is high, then you can definitely go below the diffraction limit and uh, reliably measure the separation even if you're not really resolving the speckles, if you see what I mean. And we've done other systems. Here's, here's sort of our uh, world champion at the moment. This is uh, a star from the Hipparchos catalog. It's known as a spectroscopic binary. Little measure we've made of this system since about 2010 has been below the diffraction limit. We fit an orbit to that, although it's preliminary and it, we won't publish it for a while. Uh, but that I'll just tell you that that orbit is, gives us masses that are consistent with the, spect uh, the spectral information that we have. And so uh, uh, we really can do, with the dual channel instrument, uh, down to about 10 milli arc seconds at whim. So you, for the purposes of binary star observing, you turn a 3.5 meter telescope into something which is like a 10 meter telescope in terms of its measurement capability. Okay, you can do nice astrophysics with that. Um, one of my collaborators I didn't mention, but probably should have, was Y.C. Kim at Yonsei University in Korea. He's, Yonsei is one of the two Y's in Y squared isochromes, you know, it's Yale, Yonsei. And so, um, so he's basically, YC has the most updated uh, Yale, Yonsei isochrones. And so for Burnham 151, with our system, we can break down the, we can resolve the two components quite easily. We can get reliable uh, magnitude differences in that case. It's a very bright system, very high signal to noise. And so we can get individual magnitudes and colors. We can put the two points on the HR diagram with error bars and then see what the Y squared isochrones look like. And lo and behold, the system consists of two subgiants. So they have both evolved off the main sequence. And essentially, the uh, you know, curves you see, those are isochrones of different ages. And the heavier portion of the middle isochrone is the mass range uh, that your, that uh, would match the dynamical masses, essentially. So basically, the photometry and the dynamical masses match quite well in this case. And you can, for, you know, the extra piece of it is you can get a very nice uh, age for this system because the, the components have evolved off the main sequence. So this system is about 4.6 giga years old. OK, so let's talk about Kepler for a couple minutes. We're doing ground-based follow-up for Kepler and for Koro. Um, that's generate, generating a lot of our time that we use wind now. So it's about 12 nights a year for Kepler observations. Here's an example of a 14th magnitude star that we've uh, resolved into two. The advantage for Kepler of having this high resolution imaging is, as you may know, Kepler is a great photometer, but it's not a very good imager. And so the pixels are about four by four arc seconds on the sky. So they need high resolution imaging to uh, vet their candidate transit events uh, because one of the false positives you could get is very close to the star you care about could be a background eclipsing binary star that is uh, modulating the brightness a little bit. And so um, Steve Howell and I got together and he decided that uh, the DISI instrument had something to offer. So we, we in fact are doing quite a lot of Kepler observations. Now even if we see a companion, that doesn't necessarily rule it out as a transit event. but. Uh, there are other ways that you can sort of tell whether it's a transit or not. But if, it, if there is a companion, then you definitely need to incorporate that information into the Kepler model because it has, it'll change your, the radius of your star. Or sorry, of your, of your, well, change the radius estimate of the star and the planet uh, if you judge it to be a transit event in the end. So here's a nice figure from a uh, paper of Steve Howell. This basically shows the various techniques for uh, and parameter space uh, for detecting companions around um, Kepler stars. And so um, over on the right, you can tell what Kepler imaging can do, you know, right off of the satellite, so it's not very good. You could miss companions, you know, that were even uh, three arc second companions. The satellite would not see it itself. Then there's an AO program um, that uh, Kepler does, and that gets quite a lot of parameter space inside that, all the way over here. But the inner uh, side of that for the AO system that's being used uh, sort of has this slope to it here, which is not true with our instruments. So basically, there's a wedge 
of parameter space that Speckle can get to that the AO system can't. All right, and it's basically companions in here that we're, base, we're the only game in town. Now, you might ask me, we could say, well, this is a, this is a particularly bright Kepler star. It's 8.2 is, is the magnitude there, and we have a sensitivity of about five magnitudes with our camera, so we could find companions down to about 13.6. You could ask, well, what if you have a fainter star, uh, you know, as your Kepler star, and basically in that case, there we go, then what happens is that the camera is not as sensitive to large delta Ms if you start with a primary star which is fainter, but nonetheless, uh, it, it has something to offer basically throughout this whole wedge of parameter space so that we can de detect some companions that the other uh, things can't. Okay, the last of the three projects is looking at cluster binaries. So I mentioned that we're looking at M67 and M35. This is a really interesting comparison of two clusters, two open clusters, because they're basically at the same distance, about 800 parsecs, uh, but they're very different ages. M35 is about 150 million years old, and M67 is about 4 giga years old. Okay, so here's an interesting thing that where you could study the dynamics of binaries and multiples in the cluster environment. So we've been looking at all of the targets we can get uh, in these, and actually on one of our earliest runs, uh, we found that this star right here that was well above, you know, the turnoff, uh, resolves itself into a binary system where the separation is about 0.04 arc seconds. Okay, so at 800 parsecs, that's maybe something like uh, 40 AU. And the other thing is, that at least in the, in the, the data we have so far suggests that the primary in that system is very blue, so it's actually a blue straggler star that has a companion which is over here at the base of the giant branch. So this is a pretty interesting system. And I had hoped to update this plot for the meeting here, but I didn't uh, have the time. But I can just tell you that uh, in our latest run, we discovered six more binaries in this cluster, and then we've got two in M35. So it should be, in the end of the day, kind of an interesting thing. The last thing I want to mention, I'll probably run out of time here, is that we have taken our camera to the Gemini telescope, Gemini North on Mauna Kea. And so uh, in the left hand here is a picture of the instrument on Gemini. It was really hilarious to go to Gemini because uh, it's the only time in my career where we put the instrument on the telescope and all of the support staff just laughed because it was so small compared to the <laughs> instruments that they're normally putting on there. And they had to have this big cage around it uh, in order to, you know, just you know, mount all of the weight to, to properly uh, balance the telescope. So that's kind of funny. <laughs> Anyway, so on the right is an image uh, that we got at win of a 12th magnitude star that we then looked at at Gemini. So here's the difference. Here's okay, kind of fun. Uh, we've also looked at uh, extended targets. So here's Pluto and Charon. This incidentally would be the reconstructed image we'd get from a point source. So we can see that Pluto and Charon are definitely resolved. There are about 10 airy disks across uh, Pluto. So that was fun. Now that's in a PASP paper that we had out uh, last September. And then uh, I'll just wrap up with this slide. So uh, the instrument's functioning well, and uh, it looks like that we'll be able to go back to Gemini this summer. So one of the main things I wanted to tell everybody at this meeting is that when Gemini uh, calls for proposals for the second semester of this year, there will be an opportunity to use this instrument. So if you have your favorite targets, you could actually propose to use this in as, uh, instrument at Gemini North, and we're, we're hoping that we get a number of proposals from the community. The good news is, if you do that and you get time, you don't have to reduce the data, because I'm supposed to do that. <laughs> and then I'm supposed to send it to you. So, uh, But anyway, uh, if you have good ideas for how to use this instrument, either for extended targets or binaries or what have you, then please consider proposing to that uh, announcement. Okay, great. Thanks a lot.